Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Chang, and I am here at the U of O campus in Eugene uh, in the Ford Alumni Center. And I am so excited to have you all join us, joining us for this very special webinar, uh, specifically for uh, our, our stellar recent graduates. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm here on campus, but I'm here as part of the University of Oregon Alumni Association uh, as, as uh, a representative to uh, help you as recent graduates stay connected and engaged to the university, uh, but also to, to support you in your future uh, success beyond the University of Oregon. Um, today, uh, we're thrilled to be here to do the third part of our career webinar success series that we've been uh, doing over the course of this past summer. Uh, today's webinar will focus on personal finance 101, and we know it's a topic that many of you, if not all of you, are uh, super excited about. Um, we are very uh, lucky to have a special guest uh, who my colleague Camille will be introducing in just a moment. Um, but just to let you know, uh, we will have about uh, about 60 minutes of content prepared for you. Uh, during that time, as part of this WebEx program, you will be able to see that there's the ability to ask questions. Uh, so as you type in questions, uh, my colleague Camille will uh, keep track of those. And when uh, Charles is through with his presentation, when we get to the Q&A section, Camille will be using the uh, questions that you've submitted to ask Charles for his input. So uh, before I get any further, uh, once again, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, just as a quick plug of the University of Oregon Alumni Association, uh, many of you uh, know that our mission is to help make the University of Oregon stronger by fostering lifelong relationships with our alumni and facilitating relationships between alumni. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the third in our webinar series, but I know uh, that all of you are both near and far from campus and there is such a wealth of activities uh, that is going on across the country for Ducks, uh, and I hope that you'll have a chance to take a look at uh, those various offerings. We'll have uh, more information at the end of the program. Uh, but for today, I do want to acknowledge that we are thrilled with the uh, representation of alumni on this webinar. Uh, of course, we have lots of alumni from Oregon uh, and, and a, a wonderful showing from California's, uh, California as well, but it was super exciting to see that we also have registrants from Florida, Hawaii, Maryland, Las Vegas, New York, Pennsylvania, and even a, a registrant from Chile. So um, we love the fact that you're connecting with the U of O, uh, both on the West Coast, uh, from the West Coast, as well as those who have gone far and wide representing um, the school that we love. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, the other announcement I will, uh, I guess finish up with is um, as recent uh, graduates, we are thrilled to have you, uh, you know, uh, in our midst. Uh, for the most recent graduates, I think all of you know that you have that one year uh, free membership to the Alumni Association, and we really hope that you'll use this year to this year to check us out. Uh, check out the website for additional resources and benefits for members, and then. Uh, of course, when you have events that are both in person and online, members get a discount. So uh, one of the best deals is also if you choose to do the lifetime membership within the first four years of graduation, uh, your um, uh, uh, lifetime membership rate is 50% off, which is pretty amazing. Um, and, and you can also choose to sign up for that via uh, the $25 credit card payments on a monthly basis, which makes it very easy to take care of. So enough of the University of Oregon Alumni Association. Again, we're here just to be your representatives and uh, to cheer you on to future success. Um, speaking of alumni, it's my privilege to introduce my colleague, uh, Camille Ogden, who herself is a 2006 grad, uh, came back for an advanced degree as well. Uh, so I will have uh, Camille introduce herself and get ready for our featured speaker. Camille. Hello, everyone. Thank you, James. We want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Oregon Community Credit Union, and it's really the partnership between the UO Alumni Association, our members, all of you here with us today, and Oregon Community Credit Union that make programs like this possible. Um, so Oregon Community Credit Union, they pride themselves on treating all of their members not just as customers or as transactions, but as a member and an owner. So if you aren't familiar with OCCU, we encourage you to check out their 
their website. Um, they do have a special connection to Eugene. They were founded here in 1956, and since then they've grown to over 133,000 members. And a fun fact, you don't have to live in Oregon to be an OCCU member. Um, they have a range of online services and a shared branching program that helps members stay connected throughout the U.S. and abroad. So if you're not familiar with OCCU, we encourage you to check them out. Uh, we really just want to thank them for their sponsorship of this um, program tonight. And then moving into the program, we want to introduce Charles Sheaf. He's our presenter. And Charles has an extensive background in mortgages, lending, and consumer credit counseling. So with that kind of background, he's a very knowledgeable expert and educator on managing and protecting your financial future. So thank you, Charles, for being here with us. And Charles also, um, he represents or he works with Balance, which is a nonprofit financial coaching company that has been helping people achieve financial success for over 45 years. So I'm sure Charles will tell us a little bit more about Balance and, and the background he has with them. Um, but Charles, thanks for joining us. I think you're in the Bay Area, and uh, we just want to welcome you and, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Camille, and thank you for having me here. I, as Camille said, I have been working for Balance for the past eight and a half years, and Balance's mission now is to help individuals with their financial needs during certain stages of their lives, whether it be recent grads from University of Oregon or uh, somebody that is starting out a family or purchasing a home or actually needs any help with any of their uh, credit. Balance is there to help individuals with their financial needs when they do need this. So one of the things that we're, and I've been working in balance, we do pre-purchasing, we do bankruptcy counseling, we do credit counseling, but I primarily work in the default counseling. So what that means is I've been working in an uh, industry where people have fallen behind on their mortgages one, two, three months, four, five, seven years, and I'm there to try and help them resolve their issue and hopefully avoid foreclosure overall. And a lot of it does have to do with the basics of personal financing. They're the ones uh, with the basics of the personal financing. It's out there to help you to uh, guide you through uh, anything that you want to get towards your retirement. So Camille, let's go with the next slide. So here's basically the elements of the personal finances. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. So don't feel overwhelmed. If it's too much at one time, just take your time about it. Just think of it, hey, I finished school. There was a lot I had to do to school to graduate. I made it, I finished it, but I went through it step by step. So we're gonna do it step by step. We're gonna talk about money management, basically saving for later on, creating a cash flow, creating a budget in order to make sure that we have money ready. I know it doesn't sound like it's time to talk about it, but ready for our retirement. The other thing that is, if we're looking out there to purchase a new car, or if we are even interested in uh, getting a home, we're gonna be talking about the credit and debt repayment. A lot of times that we have to look at is we do have to look at goals, because in order to retire, uh, retire with the money that we want, we want to set goals. And in order to set goals, you want to be doing it on a regular basis. You don't want to be doing it, oh, I'm going to set a goal for retirement and then look 30 years down the way, setting another goal for retirement. So we're going to be talking about credit report monitoring. We're going to be talking about the three major credit bureaus and how your credit is determined. We're going to be talking about saving money to the side. We want to make sure that any time that we put money to the side, we're always putting a little bit. Even if you feel like you never can put any money to the side, even if we're putting $5 a week to the side, that's $290 a year that you've already put to the side. We're going to talk about investing because a lot of times the cost of living tends to grow faster than what we make. So we want to put something in a vehicle where we can increase our funds with the cost of living. There's also uh, tax planning. A lot of times you can get a lot of tax breaks for different ways that you invest your money. We'll talk about the retirement planning. For a lot of us that are beginning careers, we're going to talk about the 401ks or any retirement plans that your employer may be offering. 
then we're going to also talk about insurance because a lot of times if you want to save additional funds, you really want to be able to put money aside and be able to afford those major emergencies such as car repairs, home repairs, medical, anything like that. You want to be able to do that. So go ahead, Camille, next slide. But one of the problems that everybody has is overcoming obstacles. They use different obstacles stating, hey, what can actually cause us to fall behind? And one of the tools that people do is lack of direction. It's like, I don't know what I'm saving for. Why should I save now? Uh, I don't really feel like it's really beneficial to me to actually do the savings. Why is that? So that is one obstacle that people have when they're trying to uh, save. Another one is, I know when I did school a long time ago, I ended up getting a lot of credit cards. And hey, I wasn't working, but I was using that debt and I built up a lot of debt over time. I was eventually able to pay those off. But once I paid those off, I felt like, oh, that took a lot to pay that off. So have I built up a lot of debt? I'm never going to pay off that debt. There are ways to pay down debt quicker and save at the same time. There's also procrastination. I myself was a big procrastinator. I was always going to school, and when I was going to school, when test time came, I was saying, ah, you know what, I'd rather clean my room. I'd rather do the dishes. I'd rather fix a car. I'd rather do something else than study. I finally turned that around, but until I turned that around, that didn't happen. So the procrastination actually caused me to have my goals delayed. And once again, we do are talking about inflation. The cost of living does increase between 2 to 5% per year a lot of times. And I was just thinking about it the other day. When I first went to the movies, for the movies and popcorn, I paid a dollar for all that. Now, I ask people in one of my workshops, how much do they pay for the movies? And just one person pays $25 for the movie ticket and popcorn and soda. So if we're trying to save, if we put money in the mattress, yeah, we'll save the mattress, but because of the cost of living increase increases, we won't have enough to cover the regular living expenses over time. So we want to be prepared for those cost of living increases as well. So what you need to do is you actually need to create a cash flow. So this is basically whatever money that we're bringing in and whatever money we're spending. So a lot of times when we're creating a cash flow, if we are working right now, maybe some of us have jobs or maybe we're looking for the jobs or the dream job that we want and don't have a job yet. What I would do is if you don't have a job yet and you do are waiting for that dream job, Put in the salary you want and use that as your cash flow. The other thing is if you're spending money right now on any items, if you actually rent right now, you want to put down your rent, your how much you're spending on rent, your utilities, you put down on your utilities. So you actually want to take a look at when you are spending on anything. When, uh, the other thing too is you want to create a spending plan that reflects your goals. So when you're uh, talking about goals, you're going to be setting goals to the side. Excuse me for just one moment. So we will be talking about the goals a little bit later. The other thing that you want to do is when you are taking a look at your expenses, one of the golden rules that you always put forward, and don't forget when we're talking about the basics of personal finances, we're now talking about your own personal finances. We're not talking about the uh, economy. We're talk not talking about, hey, what happens if who wins the election. We're talking about your own personal finances now because these only affect you. They don't affect anybody else. So when you do that, you're going to create a cash flow. Once you cr create a cash flow, I think I did uh, – give a handout. I'm not too sure if it's showing up, but I sent in a handout. And on that handout on page three, I believe, is your income and expenses. There's one column in there for what you're spending right now. And if your income 
exceeds your expenses, we're doing well. If your expenses exceed your income, then we w what we have to do is we have to look in that proposed column and decide what we need to adjust. A lot of times when people aren't paying attention to their money, their money takes control of them. What we want to do is we, we want you to take control of your money. This also allows you to create a spending plan. You can actually sit there and say, okay, I've put down my money, I've spent what I spent, and I see what I'm spending, so I know exactly how much I'm spending per month. A lot of times when I'm counseling people or talk with people about doing a money management plan, they tell me that, oh, yes, I've done one. When was the last time that you've done one? Oh, I did it when my taxes were done. I had my accountant do it. They usually don't do a month-to-month. -month. So you do want to look at it on a regular month-to-month -month basis because if you know what you're doing, you can always adjust accordingly. The other thing, too, is as far as trying to determine your net worth. Your net worth is very simple. It's your assets minus your liabilities. So eventually when we own a home or savings or anything like that, that those are your assets. Our liabilities are our bills, basically, if we're paying off credit cards, paying car payments. And the other thing you may want to remember, what, may, what you may have to remember moving forward is now that we're all recent graduates, those student loans. Don't forget about those student loans that you may be paying in the next six or nine months, depending on how you got them. Hopefully some of us have already paid them off. Um, but you want to put those in your cash flow as well to make sure, hey, I can afford to pay this and my other obligations. All right, next slide. Great. And Charles, I just wanted to add that uh, for the people listening in, uh, the handout that Charles was just mentioning, when we send a follow-up email after the webinar, it'll provide you a link to access that worksheet. So the attendees don't have it right now, but they will have it uh, hopefully, if not this evening, uh, early tomorrow. Okay, no problem. Thank you. You bet. So next, uh, next slide. Now, a lot of times, in order to purchase a new car or purchase a home or anything, in order to build credit, we need to start using credit. But you want to use credit wisely. You don't want to overspend. So a lot of times when we're using credit wisely, we pay off balances, we pay off in time, we make sure that everything is paid off. And just remember, when you're getting credit, you're actually paying for the obligation to use credit. So you definitely want to pay it on time. Also, take a look at the card's interest rate. Seek cards with low interest rate because you want to see if you can get low interest rate. There's no annual fees and if there's a long grace period. Be aware of teaser rates too. They may say they give you a lower interest rate for this, this card, but then after about a certain amount of time, the card can turn into a high interest rate where you're paying about 18% on the card when you started out at a 4% interest rate. So you definitely want to take a look at that. So there's a couple things you want to be aware of credit moving forward is there are three major credit bureaus that individuals look at, and that are those are the Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. And the credit reports are reporting on your credit, on your obligations to pay them back. And it's, a, it's basically saying, okay, we see that Charles is making this payment. He owes us this per month. He is paying us on time. So any time that you do take a look at that, you want to make sure that everything on your credit report is factual. A lot of times, I, my cousin and I, we have the exact same name. The only difference is our middle initial. His information was on my credit report at one point. It did take a little while to get his information removed, but I also double checked the credit report. And with that, I took a look at it and said, hey, I can actually get that off. And hey, is that, is that uh, credit, is that Visa card mine or is that my cousin's? And it turned out to be my cousin's. So it took about six months, but I did it all for free by just contacting each of the major credit bureaus with doing that. So you wanna make sure that everything on there is factual in addition, when you have multiple cards, 
they are required, the creditors are required to report to at least one credit bureau. They don't have to report to all three. So a lot of times when they're reporting and you hear people talking about credit score, which actually measures your risk, they're talking about the risk that you'll pay all your credit debt back with all, all the information you have. So they're taking a look at the risk saying, okay, with that risk, we'll pay you, uh, we'll give you this card or we'll give you this car, we'll give you this house, and we'll give you a lower interest rate. And that's based off your score. So it's a combination. Your credit score and your credit report are two different items. And you are allowed to take a look at your credit report for free at annualcreditreport.com once a year. If you are denied any credit, you can contact the creditor, ask them which report that they came from, and ask them to send you another credit report for free. Now, because they don't report to all three, your credit report has a range. So your credit report, if you have excellent credit report on all three credit bureaus, your credit score could be 740, 760, 800 with doing that. So all those things could actually happen, but they would take the middle credit score. The score is actually measuring the risk once again. The other thing you want to be aware of is how do they measure the score? What is the most impact on my credit when they're doing your credit score? And 35% of your score is based on on-time payments, so you always want to pay on time. Another 30% uh, is the amount owed. So you really don't want to have a huge balance because if you have a high balance on your credit cards and you can't pay them and you're unable to pay the balance in full off each month, then they'll see that you're using a high balance and that's 30% of your score. The other part is 15% is your length of history. So if you have your score out, your credit report out and the length of history, is a new card where you just got today, you just began a new history. The other thing is, if you've had a card for a while, the length of history, as long as you've made payment, let's say that you got it freshman year when you were at Oregon, but you've had it for four years now, you have four-year history on there. The other thing that they do use is the type of credit, which is 10% of your score. So a car payment is an installment loan, mortgage payment and student loan, student loan, installment loan, personal loans, usually installment loans, but usually credit cards are revolving debt. So they know that you may end up using, even if there's no balance on the credit card, you may end up using the credit card down the road. The other thing that you wanna be aware of is with that credit card, that balance, the higher the balance, the higher your minimum payments are gonna be. The lower your balances are, the lower your minimum payments are going to be. So when the Oregon Community Credit Union looks for you for a car or a new house, they're going to take a look at to see what your minimum payments are and hit you with the minimum payments. So you'd rather want you, them to hit you with a low minimum payment instead of a high minimum payment. So that's the thing you want to be aware of. Also be aware of if you're trying to pay down debt and get out of debt, you want to make sure that you actually pay um, if you need to transfer into a lower interest rate, make sure when you t transfer that they don't have those teaser rates. And also when you transfer your credit, usually what happens is when you transfer, the balance that you have is tacked on to the card to the credit limit. So you once you transfer that to balance, you may have that lower interest rate, but your credit limit may be high. So they also take a look at the use the type of use of the credit card. If you don't use your credit card, uh, the servicer or anybody that, whoever is the bank, will uh, close your credit card and that affects your credit history. So the other thing is if we don't have credit, one of the things that you can do is you can actually get a secured credit card. You can look at the Oregon Community Credit Union and see if they offer the secured credit card. And basically what it is, is you put down 250 to $500 for a secured credit card, and you can actually use that as a regular credit card. I do recommend using it minimally uh, for small purchases. 
And then after about one or two years, it can turn into an unsecured credit card, and in some cases, the interest rate could go down. Usually, secured credit cards are a little bit higher with doing that. The other way to build credit is you can become an auth authorized user on a card, but anybody that you do decide to use as an authorized user, you want to make sure that uh, they're paying their bills on time because it will also affect you if they're not paying their bills on time. So let's go to the next slide, which should be debt. So there is good debt and there is bad debt. Good debt is assets. So basically if we have a uh, home, and a home can eventually turn into an asset once you uh, pay it off. Bad debt is if uh, we pay our credit card to pay for a dinner or uh, uh, something where it's cash, where it's flexible and you can't really, it doesn't assess any um, good debt. So you want to be aware of what is good debt and what is bad debt. The other thing too is you want to be aware of warning signs that could happen to you along the way. So a lot of times, even though that I did mention minimum payments earlier, if we are only paying minimum payments, that could be a warning sign that, hey, maybe we have too much debt. We may want to try and work something out where we're paying a little bit more besides minimum. Once again, if we can pay off the balances, we pay off the balances. Excuse me. Okay. The other thing is not knowing our balances. So if we take a look and say, oh, we're, we don't have to worry about our balances. If we don't know our balances, we have no idea of exactly how much we paid down or paid off or if we still owe on the balance. So if we don't know our balances, it can be very difficult. The other thing is if we still have a balance and we're not able to pay it down, it's like holding a half a bottle of water. Up in, up in the air, that bottle of water is so, so half full. In 20 minutes, that bottle of water is going to be very, very heavy, and you're not going to be able to control it, and you're going to have to put it down. Same thing with high balances that you're not able to pay off. Also, the interest rate. So a lot of times, if you don't make payments in time, they hike up your interest rate. It's a possibility. In addition, if you uh, haven't paid down your balance in full, for some uh, people, by the time the next payment comes around, if you haven't paid your balance in full, you could actually be charged interest on the unpaid balance again, and on that one, it could be possibly per day. So also, don't go over your limits. If you know what the limit is, don't go over the limit, because there's additional fees that may be assessed when you go over your limit. Also, try not to use cash advantage. Because cash, cash advance, what that does is that does allow you to use cash. However, the interest rate is a little bit higher, and you end up spending a little bit more for other living expenses if you're trying to pay uh, credit cards for living expenses. So you do want to make sure that you don't overuse your credit. It's okay to use credit wisely, but you do want, don't want to use credit unwisely. Next slide. So once we figured out our debt, once we take a look at uh, the information that we have, once we put our income and expenses together, the next thing we need to do is we need to set goals for ourselves. And the purpose of setting goals is to make sure that we can actually attain them. So there's short-term goals. These are usually goals that we can achieve within the next three to 12 months. So those would be uh, basically like birthdays, vacations. I, my brother and sister and I, we celebrated my mom's 80th. She did work uh, for the Cal Alumni Association for a long time when the Pac-12 was Pac-8. So um, she basically, we decided we're going to give her a birthday party, and we decided that in January. 
we decided it was going to be about eight hundred dollars uh, per person, and there were about seventy-five people we had on the list. If we took that money, divided it by six months, we have a specific date and a specific time that we have decided when to make that uh, payments. But we're putting aside the money per month because it was a little bit much for all three of us to try and save that amount of money per month. We just divided that money out per month, which actually turned out to be about $400 per person for the past six months. The bad news is she didn't have everybody come to the party, which was good news for us because it costs us less. And the venue that we originally had changed, and that was a little bit less too. And we already had enough money saved before we even reached our goal. The other thing that we were able to do is we she loves the cow band, so we were able to get the cow band to play for her birthday. So she was very happy about that. So you do want to set specific goals. You also want to make them realistic. You don't want to uh, make them unrealistic. My stepson is making a goal of trying to reach a uh, million dollars by the time he t turns 33. He's unemployed, and he's 30. So I don't think he's going to make it, but if he does, I'll be shocked. The other thing, too, is we do want to set midterm goals as well. Midterm goals are anything within the next one to three years. Those will be the goals that we try and set for ourselves where, hey, we're going to put, purchase a car. We're going to put a down payment on a house. We know that we may not have the funds available for the full house at that time, but we're able to put that money to the side. So. It's also something that we uh, – it's achievable. That's something that is definitely achievable. So you want to be it's, uh, specific, achievable, reachable. So that's the reason that you put down the date that you actually want to do it. If you want to purchase a home in the next three years, in 36 months, how much are you going to put the down payment on the home is? So you want to make it reachable, and you put a time constraint on it. So basically, if you don't, didn't realize, I just spelled out smart, measurable. Smart. I uh, forgot the measurable there. Um, the other thing is for long term goals, these are anything for retirement or for uh, you want your kids to go to Oregon, uh, you want to save for them when they're ready to go. You, any savings, we want to put savings aside per month as, uh, as well. So the, any one of these, you can put savings aside, but in the majority of the run, the long term, you're going to put three or more years, you're going to continue to put savings to the side. The other thing is there will be obstacles that we talked about earlier, and one of those obstacles is emergency funds. What if a car breaks? What if, uh, if somebody needs to go to the hospital? What if uh, there is um, – you are in a home now and there's home repairs that need to be done. So anything that could happen, you want to prepare for those as well to make sure – moving moving down that, hey, we can actually afford to do this. So that's why you want to make those goals and set those goals for yourself. Now, you can actually, once you reach those goals, you can change the goals. And I have planned on a vacation for my wife for the past two years. I haven't reached the goal yet, but I'm almost there. So you can have goals going on all the time, and you can change the midterm goals. If you're not quite there for the down payment of the home, Maybe you have to extend it out another two years before you reach that down payment. Little things like that, but always adjust your goals on a regular basis. Next slide. We talked about the credit report monitoring earlier. Basically, that's uh, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Once again, any disputes, we'll dispute uh, with the credit bureaus directly. And you can actually do it in writing. A lot of times there are uh, credit repair companies that are out there that offer to repair your credit. Actually, the only people that can repair your credit is you, nobody else. And sometimes they dispute all, everything on your credit report. And remember I said earlier, the length of history, they'll close that history from you. So it could have an impact on your credit, credit reporting and credit monitoring. So just be careful out there. And since I already spoke about it, let's move on to the next slide earlier. Savings. Always put yourself first. Now, there's different ways to save, 
and if you have payroll deductions, you can actually put a percentage of your savings to a savings account. You can put it to the side, always put the money to the side, and that way you'll never miss it. A lot of times uh, what I do is I have a bank account that I don't even go to, and I use that bank account for my savings, and I just put in money there on a regular basis. In addition, even though I talked about not really putting money under the mattress, I have a change jar. So when I actually am saving money, if I, you know, not doing anything and I want to, you know, I'm watching cow bears play the Oregon Ducks, I go underneath the couch, see if there's any change, I put it in my change jar. So what happens is over time, that change jar can hold $500 worth of change. And I know once it's full, it's $500. So it does take a while to fill up, but I don't touch it. I put it in a place where I can't see it, but I know exactly where it is. The other thing too, any additional things that you can do for savings if you're paying down your debt as well, let's say that your minimum payment is uh, $25 on a Visa credit card, but you're actually paying $100. If you pay down your debt uh, already and you were paying that $100, Continue to pay that $100 if you can't afford to do so, but put it in a savings account. There are guidelines that you can follow is basically 10% of your net income should be used towards savings. So that's the way that you want to do that. My grandfather always said if you can put down more than 10%, you really do want to put down more. The other thing is if you're getting a raise or a bonus, any time that you have a bonus, if you've been living without that bonus, try not to use that as a income. Try and put that towards savings with anything like that. You also do want to establish an emergency account savings, typically three to six months of essential expenses. It does say in the handout that you're going to take a look at, it should be if uh, – you're a couple three months if you're um, or if you're a couple it should be six months if you're single it should be three months of your house payment I always recommend it the other way around if you're single or on your own six months because if anything should happen you're able to cover for those additional six months why if you're unemployed have a medical in injury anything like that to cover it, any additional basic needs if you're a couple and both of you are working, it's three months. That's the only difference where I differ on the handout with doing that. Um, so you do want to put the money to the side. You want to keep track putting the money aside. Next slide. So now it's time to look into investing. So examine your considerations. Examine the ex exec uh, excuse me, objectives. So where do you want to actually invest your money? Where do you want to put it? And that is a good thing that you want to do. A lot of times people feel that, oh, I can put money in uh, later. We'll do a little procrastination. I can put money in later in to my investment. Well, think about it this way. Nowadays, by the time most of us retire who have recently graduated from college, there may not be any Social Security, and Social Security is not to be used as something to live off of. Social Security is there to as a supplemental income. If we actually save $400 a month at 6% interest over time, we can actually put aside about $15,000 in uh, six years with doing that, with the interest accumulating. And over 10 years, it can turn into about $50,000. Over 20, maybe 94. By the time we retire, just putting the 400 in, nothing more, we could have over $100,000. When we're going to retire, we could actually, it is stated that by the time we retire, you're going to have to live off of a million dollars to retire comfortably. So there are time frames that you want to take a look at. There are risk tolerances. 
a lot of times if we're newly employed and we're putting money into a retirement plan with our employer, how high of a risk do we want to take? When you're young, maybe you want to take that higher risk. But remember, any investing that you do does uh, is a risk. So there's always that potential that any money that you put in, you could lose. <coughs> so you want to make sure that, hey, what am I willing to tolerate? What am I willing to put in there in order to get uh, the best benefit to me? Now, I'm about, I'm a little bit closer to retirement age, so I'm changing my risk where I'm not taking that high of a risk anymore. I used to be a person that took high risk. Now, I'm trying to balance out my portfolio. You also, uh, like we said, you want to invest early and often. So you want to diversify your portfolio. You want to uh, get into some money markets. You want to put in some stocks and bonds. You want to make sure that everything is diversified because what it does in some sections, it may lose money. In some sections, it may not make any money. I just took a look at my 401k, and I do have money in there, and I felt with the Brexit that happened recently that I thought that was going to all disappear really quickly, and mine has not. It did take a hit, but not a bad one, and it's, it continues to grow, and I always put money in there every paycheck because my company matches with what I do. Excuse me for just one moment. Okay, so you want to diversify and you want to uh, do asset allocation. So you want to decide, okay, do I want to put this in this fund? Do I want to put it in a mutual fund? Do I want to put it in stocks? Do I want to put it in a regular savings? Where do I want to put the funds that I've made today? Because by that time, those funds end up for you. Hopefully, you have received enough money to pay for your retirement and you can live comfortably by the time you retire. You'll really see it grow really quickly. So I just uh, did something here where, wrong one, where you actually take putting money into a retirement fund by the time we turn 25. If we're putting money for 10 years, like I said, that can actually extend out really quickly. Some people think there's never, uh, by the time we actually get old enough to start putting in retire, we're not going to make any money. Even 10 years can actually give you about $15,000 at a $400 value. So you want to make sure that when you're putting it together that, hey, you can actually have your money grow and your money actually works for you. Okay, just had to get on the right page. Um, the other thing is, uh, the other investment, mutual funds are an easy way to have a diversified portfolio, and they hold a wide body of investments, and you can choose a fund with a healthy asset and allocated mix rather than one overweight in one or two sections. And there's an index fund uh, provided a well-diversed and expensive exposure to the stock market. So even if you go to an index fund, you can actually see, you know, put money into the stock market a little bit and see how that does for you. So a common and effective method of spreading investment risk uh, dollar coverage average, uh, dollar cost coverage average, it's the best process of investing to set amount uh, no matter what the stock market is doing. So basically, think of it this way. When you're looking at a cost average, you're going to put money into the stock market, but you're going to do it when the stock picks uh, prices are low. Um, and then you're going to buy very few when it's high. So think of it this way. You have Oregon playing Nebraska this weekend. 
So they're going for the going for a touchdown against Nebraska. In order for them to actually score, they always have to get a fourth down. It's not necessary that somebody's going to run back and score on Nebraska, but what happens is every down they're trying to reach their goal of getting that first down in order to get closer to the main goal of getting that touchdown. So think of the uh, dollar cost average as buying small stocks, hitting that first down, you got a stock there, and then going to the next one. Every once in a while, you're going to get somebody that's going to get a long pass, and somebody's going to catch the ball and go for that touchdown, and you can still purchase at that time, but it's a little bit of higher risk. So that's the way I like to think of it, the dollar cost average is like, just take your time getting into it because you're always paying into it. And yeah, there may be a little roller coaster ride along the way, but as long as you're still paying into it, your funds can actually grow. So tax planning. Next one. You want to max out, uh, max out your individual tax planning. And just like everybody else, nobody enjoys paying taxes, but they are a fact of life. So what you want to do is you want to figure out the best way to have your money work for you. So one of those is uh, max out employer provided plans. So if you have a tax deferred employer uh, provided retirement plan at work, take advantage of it. And what it will do, it'll save you a lot of money because contributions are made with pre-tax dollars, which lowers your taxable income and possibly your marginal tax rate. And the investment grows on a tax deferred basis. So when you, when you retire and take the money out, you will be taxed on your new and in most cases lower tax rate. So that's something that you can think about down the road as well. It's like, hey, the employer's gonna do a tax uh, employer provided plan. And by the time I take the money out, I'm paying on lower taxes for money that I had them had the money deferred. You um, you can max out individual tax retirement plans as well. Basically, IRAs, both traditional and Roth, offer tax advantages, savings with a traditional IRA, and if you do not have a tax deferred plan through your employer, in addition to the tax rate compounding you also get an immediate tax deduction, saving you even more money. So contributions to a Roth IRA are made with after-tax dollars. Earnings accumulate tax-deferred and may be withdrawn tax-free if the withdrawal occurs more than five years after you first contribute to the Roth, and you are at least 59 and a half, or if the funds are used to purchase a first home. So basically, if you are planning to purchase a home down the line, a Roth may be a good idea because it can be tax deductible. Retirement planning. So uh, everyone should plan for their retirement. So basically, we have your um, 401ks, 403bs, if you're working for a nonprofit such as I am. Uh, we do have the IRAs. So if we take a look at the 401ks, and usually if you know when you're going to retire, you want to put aside 70 to 80% of your current expenses. So just remember, whatever expenses you have today, remember down the line, if those are the same expenses, 70 to 80% of those expenses you want to put to the side. And that's another savings vehicle that you're going to want to put to the side. So a 401k is tax deferred and the employer sponsors the retirement plan. Uh, an employer can contribute a fixed amount percentage or a pre-tax income, usually between one and 15%. If you're able to do the full contribution, I do highly recommend doing the full comp contribution, but if you're struggling with the savings and not able to save, don't do it that much always contribute at least 3%. Uh, the other thing too is the money your employer has contributed to your tax uh, 401k is a vesting period. And usually after you've been with the employer or been in that 401k for at least three to five years, they'll start vesting or matching 
your retirement plan. So you can actually have that grow for you as well. There are traditional, I think I can go to the next slide. There are traditional IRAs. Uh, they provide tax deferred investment alternatives for people who aren't covered at a plan at work. So if your work doesn't have a 401k or a 403b plan, this basically can cover for your retirement as well. You can purchase stocks and bonds or mutual funds with these and uh, or cash equivalents. And you only pay tax when the funds are withdrawn. Unlike traditional IRAs and Roths, consistent or after-tax money, contribu contributions are permitted after age 70 and a half, as long as you and or your spouse has earned income. And there is no requirement that withdrawal commences after a certain age. So there's no deadline or anything like that. Now, a lot of people, especially individuals who've graduated recently, and I always read about millennials always starting with startup businesses or starting their own business, there are self-employed retirement plans. And a few of those uh, are helpful because they can actually help you for your own when you retire, no matter if you're self-employed for three to five years or if you uh, end up being self-employed for 40 years, I always recommend getting into a self-employed retirement plan. Uh, one is the SEP, the Simplified Employment Pension. It's an individual retirement account for a self-employed individual. And you can contribute about 15% of your annual compensation. Usually there is a ceiling of about 41,000 a year and the tax deduction is limited, is limited, is the same for the regular IRA. The other thing is you can contact the Oregon Community Credit Union to see what type of uh, retirement plans that they can offer you for the position you're in as well. Uh, Keo accounts are similar to 401ks uh, accounts for the self-employed and you can contribute once again up to 20% of your self-employed income as a Keo plan with a limit of about 41,000. So, um, And then the entire contribution of the Keogh amount is tax deductible. So whatever you contribute can be tax deductible as well. So anything that can help you out as far as tax deductions, talking with a CPA, any retirement plans, I do recommend talking with them. And um, anybody, anybody else you can talk with, such as the Oregon Community Credit Union, seeing what they can do to help you out as well. The other thing is, a lot of us will require insurance. Insurance actually is a protected savings. So a lot of times when you're doing insurance coverage, those bills that you may have for insurance may not cover everything that's required. So a lot of times people get life insurance, especially for indiv individuals that are married or uh, have children. Once they have children, you uh, should have life insurance. I've talked with a lot of people in my line of work and I asked them, is there gonna be anything coming their way? And it's like, no, the person never had life insurance to begin with. And what it can do, it helps pay for those times if you are the sole provider for the family, it pays for those. If you're not the sole provider, it will help pay for any additional costs that may come your way for anybody else. Uh, medical. You know, we do have the Obama plan that's out there today, but that doesn't cover all the expenses. And sometimes we need additional medical insurance in order to cover for those uh, additional needs. A lot of people I counsel, they, you know, they do have their basic medical needs, but they also have the other needs such as, you know, their surviving cancer payments. So they have chemo, they have additional costs to them that adds up very, very quickly. There's also assets uh, that people have for homes. So homeowner's insurance is something that people are required to get for a home if they plan on purchasing a home. And it does cover the house should something go wrong. A lot of times if there's a leak in the house, like if there's a major plumbing or flood, that can damage not only walls, water, that can create molding, can create uh, 
that atmosphere. So if you aren't able to fix that, it can cause medical issues for people living in the home. So you do want to make sure that you have that. Car insurance. I'd, I'm a person that definitely purchased car insurance. What happens a lot of times is I even had bought a car with my stepdaughter. We purchased the car together. I told her, don't drive the car unless you have insurance. Guess what she did? She drove the car without insurance and she got an accident. I always believe the minute that you don't have an insurance is the minute something's going to happen to that car. So always get insurance that'll cover things, that'll cover tow, that'll cover expenses. If you're at fault, hopefully some of that will cover any court costs should there be any. So you want to make sure. The other thing it could cover, it could cover additional medical costs as well. It, uh, in some cases, you can actually get insurance for your jewelry. So you can actually uh, see if your homeowner's insurance actually covers loss of jewelry or theft uh, with doing that. The next thing that we want to take a look at is long-term disability. So with the long-term disability, if you're on short-term disability, that'll be uh, for a little while. But if something should happen where you're unable to work, and you have to get on long-term disability, a lot of us that work and make a lot of money, that will end up being about 60% of your income. So you do want to get long-term disability if you have to, because that can cover some costs as well. So with all these costs, with everything that I've been telling you today, with all this money management, with all these tax plans, with all these retirement plans, with all these insurance coverage, it's a lot to take in in one hour session. So any advice that you can get from any friends or family that you know that may be tax professionals, insurance uh, agents, anybody that you can, you know, I know with the, the Alumni Association with Cal, and I'm sure Oregon is the same way, you still have those connections with the people that you've uh, graduated with. Anybody that you know that's going into that business, you want to definitely check in with. Uh, same with the Oregon Community Credit Union. You want to check in with them, see what they have to offer you, what they can suggest. If you uh, talk with any financial planners, see if there are any financial planners that you can talk with as well to see how much you can save. The other thing that you want to do is you want to see if, hey, with any money that I'm saving, what are the hidden costs that come my way? We have a vending machine here. It's a dollar fifty for sodas. So if you're buying a soda per day for five days a week, it actually turns out to be about $35 a month that you're ending up paying on sodas. So any small little thing that you do as purchasing, anything like that, you want to make sure. So once again, I know it's a lot of information to intake. I know it's a lot of information that was all sent to you at one time. But you want to make sure that, hey, if I took away something, I learned at least one thing. And I learned that the Ducks will beat Nebraska on Saturday. So that's <laughs> that's all I want to say. I want to thank uh, James and Camille for helping me out with this. This was my first webinar. I hope I did OK um, uh, with everything. If you do have any questions, I will be staying on for a little bit longer in order to answer the questions. The other thing, too, is next slide. Did I cover everything? We, once again, we do want to set realistic goals. We want to embrace. You also, once you reach those goals, you want to reward yourself. You, uh, you don't want to just sit to the side and say, no, I don't want to um, reward myself. So, I want to take myself out to dinner. Just like when you finished uh, graduating, I'm sure your parents were very excited that you graduated and they took you out to dinner and hopefully gave you something. Some people maybe even got a car out of it. Um, my nephew did, I know that. Um, the other thing is, the Susie Orman, one of the things that you do want to do is, it, do, it does state you want to live within your means. Susie Orman states that you want to live below your means in order to afford the needs that you want. And don't spend everything you make. Try and put money to the side. It will take a while if we're not there yet, so be patient and then monitor your investments. Make sure you're watching. Next slide. If we're struggling with anything that you want, we do offer debt management plans, uh, credit counseling, housing counseling, pre-purchase counseling. You can contact us with the information below. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over back to Camille and James.
Great. Again, Charles, thank you so much for this, this great insight. And uh, like you said, it's a lot of information, but I think the uh, reality for a lot of recent grads is the focus has been on studying and surviving, uh, but with finances, some didn't have the luxury of being able to defer that knowledge, uh, but for those who did, this is a great crash course in the basics of finances. So Camille, um, can you let us know if any questions came in from our attendees? Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Um, Charles, can you talk a little bit about what is considered a high balance on a credit card? And is it um, relative to your income or amount you have available? Can you just kind of go a little bit more in depth about a high balance and what that means? Okay, high balance on your credit card. Usually on credit cards, you're given a limit on what you can spend. So let's say you have a credit card that has a limit of $1,000 balance on there. So when you have a high balance, your high balance is usually over 50% of what the balance is. So basically at $500, if you have a $500 balance on your credit card and your credit limit is $1,000, you're at 50% of your balance. So what you really want to be as far as your limit is concerned is you do want to be between 10 and 33 percent of your balance. So you're looking at uh, really 250 or less on your balance because a lot of times when the creditors pull your credit they're going to take a look at that and they may not they may pull it when you're paid off on the card or they may pull it when you're up at that $500 balance. It, they never tell you when they're going to pull credit because it could be any time during the month. And you, as the credit holder, are allowed a 30-day period to actually pay off the balance. So I do recommend to actually not only pay off, try and pay off the balance on the day that you receive the bill, but if you can't pay off the balance, 10 to 33%, and if you are able to, and I don't want people to um, just focus on their card and not save anything, because the whole meaning of this uh, basics, personal finance, we want you to end up saving at least something down the road. So 10 to 33 percent has been considered the norm. If they pull your credit, that's a good balance. So if you have a thousand dollar credit card limit and you have a $250 balance, that'll show the creditors that you are using your credit responsibly. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a couple questions about those early investments. So um, one specific question that came in is, is it really necessary to use a financial advisor and, and or is it a good idea um, when you're trying to diver diversify and choose where to invest? So can you speak a little bit about best practices for those first investments? Well, if you definitely know what you're doing, then, yeah, you don't have to use a financial advisor. I always recommend one if you're not sure, and because they do cost. I'm, you know, usually the financial advisors do cost. But if you have an idea of what you want to put your money in and what you want to actually uh, diversify in, whether it is the stock market, money market accounts, um, all those other different ones, uh, cost averaging plans, 401ks, anything that you want to do, you can diversify. Even with my own 401k plan, I do contact uh, the company's um, individual uh, financial advisor to figure out my best way to make my gr money grow. And I do contact him you know, once a year. And he actually comes out to our uh, place of business and he sets an appointment time for everybody and everybody goes and sees him. So everybody likes him because he actually comes to our place of business and we can actually sit down and talk with him for about a half hour or so and work on, work on our own portfolio. So even if you are working for a company, if they do offer a uh, retirement plan, they may have their own personal financial advisor that you can actually use or you may not have to pay anything. Great. Another question um, we had is about credit. So can you speak about what is considered excellent credit and sort of those ranges of what does it mean if my credit is 720 or 
um, you know, the numbers, the ballpark numbers to aim for? Well, 720 is a good score, yes, so first and foremost. So basically your credit scores range from uh, 300 to 850. So when they're doing a range and they're looking at your credit scores, uh, most of the time, you know, it all depends on if you're looking for a car, it, you can ask them, how did you determine my credit score? Sometimes uh, if it's a car, they may do, only use one credit bureau and they may only use that credit bureau score. Usually for a house, what they're doing is they're doing what is called a tri-merge. So they're taking your score, and once they take your, um, taking your credit reports, they're taking all three. And remember I said earlier, when you're paying for those obligations, those obligations are saying, hey, you can afford to pay for this house payment, and you can pay our obligations as well. So, and not every creditor reports to the same credit bureau. So when they pull up your score, let's say that you have, we'll stick with the 720, we have 720 on Experian, we have 740 on Equifax, and we have 700 on TransUnion. So what most lenders and servicers will do is they'll get rid of the top score, they'll get rid of the bottom score, and they'll say that your credit score is 720 because that's the middle score. Your your credit cannot go any higher than, once again, your credit can't go any higher than 850, can't get any lower than 300. The higher your score, once again, the better your interest rate. And most likely when you're looking at the credit cards, when you get credit cards with really good interest rates, you probably already have really good score. So I always think of credit scores nowadays because of the recession and because of the housing market price. An A-plus paper for a credit score probably would be about 740 or above. Doesn't mean that the, all scores are bad, it just means that that would be considered an A-plus. All right. And Charles, Anything this else? is James. I hope you don't mind me jumping in. Um, maybe an extension of that question is how can someone affect or improve their credit score? And I think going back to what you were saying about uh, the score being comprised 30% uh, uh, for example paying on time, 30% mm -hmm. all those other things. So uh, I think maybe one question is you know, how long do you have to pay on time before your credit score is affected up and what are some of the other things to control for? Okay, well, anytime you don't pay on time, that affects your score immediately. Uh, how much? It depends what it is. If you miss a payment on a credit card, that could be like one or two points. If you, I work in default counseling, if you miss a housing payment and your credit score is at 800, you miss one payment, that could drop as much as 200 points. So it all depends on the value of that, I guess the value of the asset uh, with doing that. You can always rebuild your credit by paying on time. You can actually, if you have any, once anything goes into collections or anything negative happens where you're not able to pay it back, once negative, always negative. But you can always improve it. So if you are trying to improve it and you've had things in collections, you can actually call the original uh, creditor and see if you can actually pay that back. You can also contact, um, if it's a collection company, because once you're behind on a account for a while, after about six months, then you'll start having the collection people call you. And their job is just to get you to make, you, make a payment to get you back current. So they're gonna collect. So another thing that you could do is you could contact the collection people and say, hey, I don't have all the money that you want. How about if I'm able to pay you 50% of what I owe? And you work on that and what shows up on the query report, it'll show settled. You, you also ask them to say it's settled. In addition, what you would want them to do is you would want them to tell the credit bureau that as well because then it, once it says settled, the negative impact is done. The other thing to realize is with credit, any negative Im information has a major impact on the first two years it's negative. Any year after that, it'll slowly not have as much impact. And after about seven years, usually for collection accounts, it does drop off 
doesn't mean it, you don't still owe it. It just means it won't have a major effect on your credit report. And with certain things such as bankruptcies, tax liens, judgments, you know, law things, child support, those tend to stay on your credit report a little bit longer. Some can stay 10 years. And then positive information such as paying on time, uh, paying a car in full, uh, paying off your student loan, that can stay on there usually indefinitely, but on the average it stays on there for about 10 years. Great. Thank you, Charles. Camille? Yeah. Yeah, Charles, that segues nicely into this next question. Um, would you suggest that it's better to pay more towards student loans or to focus on investing in, in retirement? Well, here's the thing about student loans. If you don't pay back your student loans, uh, a majority of the time they cannot be, and I'm not an attorney, but they can usually are not cannot be included in any bankruptcies or anything like that. So they do have a major impact on your credit score uh, with doing that. So if you can, I would recommend doing both, uh, paying student loans and paying in retirement. But if you can't, I would see if you could try and see how much you could pay off uh, the student loans. In addition, there now are, you know, we're recent grads, so I don't know if you would qualify, but there are programs that are such for student forgiveness, uh, student loan forgiveness programs, and you can go to www.studentloans.gov and look up student forgiveness loans. And we do have, uh, I believe we do have a program here, I don't know who's in charge of it uh, with doing that, but if you can just go onto our website and take a look. The other thing, too, that I did not mention is, uh, as far as calculators, there are calculators, and I'm sure uh, Oregon Community uh, Credit Union may have them as well, for seeing how much, how long it will actually take you to pay off your student loan. Uh, same here, well, how long will it take you to save for a certain amount of money for retirement as well? So you just say, hey, what, when do I plan to retire? Uh, how much money would that give me by the time I actually do retire at a certain interest rate? So we do have a calculator uh, on our website for retirement. We do have calculators for housing payments. We have calculators for all sorts of certain things. I'm pretty sure if I look carefully, I'm pretty sure there may be a student loan one there too to see how much it would cost to pay it off. If, for example, you have, pay, you have been paying into your student loan and you don't have that much more to pay off, I would actually pay that pay that off as soon as possible. Because once again, paying off a student loan has a positive impact on your credit as well, because that does show up on your credit report. Great, so the calculator that you just mentioned, would that be a tool where say you could plug in how much should I have saved in my 401k by the time I'm 26 if I want to retire when I'm 50? Yeah, it actually says how much you should be putting, the, putting to the side per month on, okay, I want to be, I want to retire by the time I'm 50. I need to be putting, uh, I'm just throwing out a number. I don't know what it actually is. I need to be putting $250 aside per month into my retirement plan in order for me to retire by the time I'm 50. Would you be willing to ballpark a number of what would be a, a realistic and or ambitious goal to have in your 401k <laughs> in your mid-20s? Yeah, okay. Let me just, uh, I'm going to do something real quick here. I'm going to go on to our website over here, and I'm just going to use the calculator. <laughs> i doing that. Hopefully it comes up, but this computer's a little bit slow. So give me just a moment. So uh, let's say what I would do is I would take your age, uh, whatever, you, whenever you turn your 50, minus your age, and then um, whether it be that 25, let's say that's 40 years from now. So that would be 480 months. So I would probably take, excuse me for just one moment. I would take those amount of months and how much you want to have by the time you turn 50 and just divide it by uh, 480 months. 
I'm, I'm doing it at a 40 year time. So let's say that you did want to have a million dollars by the time that you were, or let's say somebody's looking for 3 million divided by 480 months. That's actually about $6,000 a month that you would have to save to get to that point. So for me, if I was, if it took me 40 years, I think that'd be a little bit, uh, that could be a realistic goal depending on what the interest rate you get from your retirement funds and how much extra interest is paid into it. So I'm almost to the calculators. Hold on just one moment. Okay, calculators, let's see if it does have it. Okay. So just to let you know, I'm on the uh, website right now, and it does have, um, as far as student loans, it does have, where's the student loan? I thought I saw it. Oh. Uh, accelerated debt payoff is one. Savings. Okay, how long will my retirement savings last? Uh, flexible spending. Future value, let's see, investment. So basically, uh, initial deposit, we're going to say $500 a month, or $5,000, let's say. Am I doing this right? Yeah, okay, that's the wrong calculator. I'm trying to find the right calculator. So basically, what I, like I said at the beginning, oh, here we go, 401k. So I have about putting $500 a month uh, into a 401k plan uh, with somebody that makes, you know, you know, we're college grads, so we could possibly make 40,000 a year. Uh, and the total amount after about 35 years comes to about seven, uh, $756,000 uh, with doing that. And that's with somebody with the current age of 30. So I'm gonna put a little less age, 25. And at age, oh, want to retire at 55. So a 10% contribution into the 401k and wants to retire in about 30 years. Uh, let's say your annual increase, you get an increase in um, pay raise per year, about 3%. So uh, what I'm having for a 401k, you can actually, uh, this is still over $700,000 that I see by the time you retire at the age of 30, putting, uh, putting at least 10% of your paycheck into your retirement funds to give an idea. So there's a whole bunch of different calculators on. This one was for the 401k, but doing that. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it sounds like a great tool. Um, yeah. There's just this one last question, oh, okay. and it's about um, opinions on renting versus buying a house and how that impacts uh, your credit and, you know, any other financial implications. Well, just like when you're getting a new job, your employer is going to pull your credit, and that's usually a soft inquiry. It has no effect on your credit. Same with renting. 
your uh, landlord's going to, or whoever you're renting from, your landlord's going to do a soft pull on your credit. And what they're doing is they're making sure that you can afford to pay for the rent, and they're going to take a look to make sure that you haven't been moving from place to place to place to place as well, because your address and everything does appear on your credit report. And when I was underwriting, because I was an underwriter for a while, I did see some credit reports that every six months, this person was in a new address. So why? So if there's any reason why that's happening, especially for us recent grads, is, hey, you, you, know, you may have been on campus, so you haven't had rented before. So you do want to tell them that up front. Or if you've been off campus and, hey, I was only there uh, just for school, and that's the reason why I've had change of addresses. As long as you tell them up front, that would be okay. The difference between really renting and owning a home is uh, renting there's no end to your payments. So if you decide to rent, you're always gonna be a renter. If you decide to purchase a home, you could end up paying the same amount of money that you're renting for, but there's a eventual end to it. So most of us that are trying to purchase a home, if we can't afford the entire payment, we usually have to get a mortgage or a loan. So you can also go to Oregon Community Credit Union, and they can do something to see if you can actually afford a home. They could do a pre-qualification where you just tell them, hey, look, I want to see if I'm able to afford a home. How much would uh, I qualify if I make this amount of money and I pay all these expenses right now and I have this debt? You're not verifying anything with any documentation, so it doesn't affect your credit. They're just seeing where you stand over uh, stand overall as far as pre-qualification. The other thing is with uh, owning a home, there are tax benefits. So once again, there is an end to the payments. The other thing is there are tax benefits uh, for being a homeowner. Basically, you get a tax deduction, deduction on your interest rate. So whatever interest rate you're paying per year, you can get a tax deduction. Sometimes we, there are programs available in certain communities where they do have below market homes or down payment assistance programs that can also be a tax benefit to you as well. So if you're not able to come up with all the money, there can be some down payment assistance programs, uh, which is DALT, down payment assistance loan program, that can be a little bit tax advantage to you as well. In addition, when you go to get a loan, if you're using a mortgage broker, and you have a 5% interest rate, but you want the interest rate to be a, lower, a little bit lower, you can actually pay what they call points to bring those down. And because you pay those points, that can have a tax benefit as a tax shelter for you as a long run as well. So there are benefits to owning a home. But the other thing too, we rent a home, guess who's taking care of the maintenance of the home? Your landlord. We buy a home, you're taking care of maintenance of the home. So you want to be assured that you can definitely afford the home. And we do offer pre-purchasing programs, and I'm sure that Oregon Community Credit Union or maybe even the alumni may have access to help you out there as well. So what you do is you actually see with that information that we have, whatever you're renting for right now or paying, with that income and expenses that we talked about at the very beginning, if you can definitely afford the home, you're going to see what you can actually afford back. But you want to do, you want to be careful also, because any servicer will, if you have excellent credit, the person that had 720 or above, that's pretty good credit. If we have excellent credit, your servicer will give you the amount of loan that, uh, for the entire amount that they believe you can afford to pay back. But what they're going to do is they're going to base it off your gross monthly income. They're not going to base it off your net. When you're doing your money management, you're going to base everything off your net. So even if somebody uh, approves you for a $400,000 loan to purchase a home, and you only can afford, afford a $300,000 home, you can only afford a $300,000 home. That's the other reason you do those pre-qualifications. If you know that right now you can only afford, I'm in California, so home prices are a little bit higher. So if you only can afford the $300,000 home with that pre-qualification, it also allows you to let you know what you're shopping for. 
you're not looking for homes that are over 350,000. You're not looking for homes that are over 300,000. So a lot of information does come with purchasing a home, but there are benefits. There are pros and cons because it's going to be your most expensive uh, purchase of the home, but you're in charge of the maintenance. You're in charge of making sure that everything's set. The other thing is there's hidden costs that people don't think about. You, uh, for the loan, you're going to be paying principal and interest. But don't forget, uh, I don't, I don't think in Oregon, but in California, there's property taxes. Um, also, there's homeowners insurance, like we talked about earlier. Homeowners insurance is required for most homes if you're getting a loan. And once again, if there's any flooding or anything, because I know it rains a lot up there in Oregon, so if there's any flooding, you do want to have the homeowner insurance. So any of those things may cost you. And then once you move in, there's going to be the utility bill that you have to pay as well. So all these little things can add up to you over time. So it depends on what you feel most comfortable doing. Great, Charles. Thank you so much. Okay. I believe that was the last question, and, and that kind of keeps us on time. So okay. um, with that, again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for speaking to the recent uh, grads of the University of Oregon and sharing with you, with them, your, your fantastic wisdom on how to keep themselves uh, financially successful as they go into uh, their professional lives. Um, just uh, in terms of wrapping up this program, I just have a couple of basic announcements. Uh, in the post-webinar e post, uh, email that you'll be receiving, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you'll see that PDF, uh, a worksheet document that Charles provided us, and so that will give you some more details and some instruction in terms of how to, um, you know, make actionable uh, some of the advice that he shared. Um, in addition, in about a week or so, we'll have a recording of this webinar that we will also email out so that if you wanted to review any parts of the webinar, you're welcome to do so. Um, and then also, I know some of the people who may have signed up weren't able to join the webinar, and they'll be able to uh, watch the, the great content at that point later on. Um, uh, and uh, a couple of final announcements. Again, thank you all for being members of the University of Oregon Alumni Association. As recent grads who bought graduation packages, you have that one-year free membership to test this out. For recent grads within the last four years, again, you've got wonderful discounted prices. And I just wanted to show you very briefly some of the in-person uh, events that are taking place, not only in Oregon, like Portland, but definitely in northern and southern California, up in the in the further northern areas of Seattle, um, and then uh, we will definitely have more online opportunities for you to learn uh, for your professional and personal success, as well as opportunities for you to even connect with alumni peers through some virtual networking events that uh, my program, the Duck Career Network, uh, will be hosting. So uh, for this. This information and more, feel free to go to our website, which is uoalumni.com. And uh, just also for members and also for fun, a great way for you to show your duck pride is with an Alumni Association members only business card. Uh, you can order these through Vistaprint. Uh, these designs are exclusive to Oregon Alumni uh, Association members. Uh, you can choose the one side option, or if you choose the double sided option, uh, you've got a couple of options for uh, fun backgrounds. Uh, but you know, knowing that recent grads might be changing jobs multiple times in the first few years of work, um, this allows you to have one steady business card uh, that you can uh, represent your, your duck pride with. So um, fun thing uh, for you to check out, and you can see that the website is University of um, Alum sorry, University of Oregon Alumni Association dot, dot biz, uh, dot vistaprint dot com. Again, you can review this uh, uh, portion of the website later on. Um, so last but not least, again, thank you so much for joining us. Best of luck. Uh, at the end of this webinar, you'll see a very brief survey that WebEx, our uh, webinar platform, will ask you to complete. It's only about a question or two. But then if you also wait a moment after that, uh, a survey monkey will pop up, and that comes specifically from um, our office here at the Alumni Association. Uh, we want to be uh, able to provide you good and relevant content, so your feedback means a lot to us. So please take a moment to fill out that survey. Um, and finally, once again, thank you so much for spending your, your time with us. Uh, congratulations, recent graduates of the U of O. You make us proud, and your success makes us look 
great. Um, and then also the U of O success also adds more value to your degree from the University of Oregon. So together, uh, we will uh, do great things. So thank you so much for staying connected with us. And with that, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Camille. Uh, I will sign off and uh, go Ducks. Thanks for keeping in touch. Best wishes. Goodbye.